is global. Nuclear power and nuclear weapons pose great dangers in themselves, but nuclear institutions also exemplify key features of the global system as a whole. Both nuclear power and high technology weapons are elements in and help to sustain a circulation of trade and investment devoted to the production of goods and services that only a fraction of the world's population can afford to buy. This system has pushed much of the world's population towards the margin with luxury crops, resource extraction, and now biofuels driving hundreds of millions off the land and into burgeoning urban slums. Yet development efforts continue to center on centralized energy, like nuclear energy, and transportation infrastructure that's designed to serve global supply chains for high-end consumer goods with urban elites worldwide competing for places at the top of the starkly two-tier economy. In this kind of a world, weapons and military services are going to be a growth industry. And nuclear technology, with its potential for the ultimate in weaponry, provides a way for the inhabitants of the nuclear sector to make a profitable place for themselves, often protected and subsidized by governments that either have nuclear weapons or want to preserve the option of acquiring them. The nuclear world provides them with privileged access to their country's resources, a development context that can be shielded from foreign competition, and an entree to forms of trade that are seen as increasing as the, in importance as fossil fuels diminish. The powerful tools of nationalism and national security secrecy both facilitate the extraction of wealth from the rest of society and prevent scrutiny of national nuclear enterprises that whether in first generation nuclear powers like the United States or in post-colonial nuclear powers have been rife with technical problems, corruption, and widespread intractable environmental impacts. Yeah. Nuclear weapons remain the only human created force that could destroy global civilization in a day. A fact that remains largely absent from public discussion, as if the Cold War confrontation were the only circumstance in which nuclear war could be imagined. Yet we find ourselves today in a conjuncture that more and more bears unsettling resemblances to the circumstances that brought the great power wars of the last century. 
Rising economic powers are challenging those that have been dominant for a century, competing with them for resources and preeminence in profitable products and technologies. The magnitude and pace of, these new, of the rise of these new powers is unprecedented, and it's occurring in the context of equally unprecedented effects flowing from our approaching limits to key resources and to the carrying capacity of our planet's ecosystems. It may seem unlikely, and many argue that it's unlikely, that elites in modern societies, societies that are easily disrupted because of their dependence on these far-flung uh, supply chains of extraction and production that reach across the planet, will risk large-scale war among the most powerful states, and particularly among nuclear-armed states. But such wars are less likely to be chosen as a matter of policy than stumbled into by ruling elements who find themselves uh, facing threats to what they see as their rightful, privileged way of life, both from within and from without, and for whom the only options that ultimately are off the table are those that would require them to give up their privileged place. Over the, over the past year, the Occupy movement has brought to the fore the inequities and irrationality of the system in which small numbers of people who control financial institutions that are unaccountable to the vast majority of humanity make decisions for everyone. It's a system in which the few can take immense risks from which only they will profit, while the costs of their failures fall on the rest of us. The unfair and undemocratic nature of the financial system, however, reflects fundamental characteristics of our dominant form of economic life that extend far beyond the abstract world of money and banking. The technologies we all depend on and the built world we live in have been shaped to serve the power and profit goals of the kinds of immense organizations that are most successful in this highly inequitable global order. What wins out are technologies that both help to preserve that order and to secure profitable places in it for the people at the top. Nuclear weapons and nuclear power are preeminent examples of technologies that manifest the irrationality of the whole. Nuclear power risks destroying our communities to power them. Nuclear weapons are tools in power struggles that only determine which fraction of global elites will be best positioned to exploit the rest of us, contests in which only the few seek to profit while all of us once again bear the risk. In 1930, Nobel Prize winning physicist Robert Millikan wrote that one may sleep in peace with the consciousness that the creator has put some foolproof elements into his handiwork and that man is powerless to do it any titanic damage. He was an expert. This has been proven false not only by nuclear weapons and nuclear power, but by the devastating ecological effects of endless accumulation of wealth for its own sake, and by the growing ability of human beings to manipulate the most basic building blocks of the natural world itself. All of these issues are manifestations of a global society in which most resources and most of the earth itself is controlled by a tidal minority with choices, again, that affect us all dressed up as inevitable and necessary. A common theme in all this is that key decisions are made at a great remove, both socially and geographically, from the places where their human and ecological impacts are felt. Ironically, in a world where science is looked to for the solution to most problems, we are suffering from a disconnection between cause and effect. Our task and our challenge is to take back the power from these immense organizations, to build a world where decisions are no longer made in faraway war rooms and boardrooms, and by doing so, to democratize our economy, and by doing that, to make possible a world 
that will be livable for us all and where we all will really have a voice. Thanks. Thank you so much. I think the powerful point he made in all of that is they pretend to be logical and rational and that we're supposed to be emotional and crazy. And in fact, it is absolute insanity what they're doing and the logic is all with us. Uh, so we're going to march back with uh, the, uh, all of the Japanese family from the, that came down with us from the consulate. Um, I thought we could just gather in a circle here and take a moment of silence before we do this. Gather your things and then we're going to march back up. So would everybody come in to the center here and we can complete this energy that we've now raised in this moment in time that is so important to all of us, this anniversary. And if you're all wondering, this is a major PG&E headquarters. That's why we're here. So let's all gather in. And on the march, we'll have different people leading us with chants. So if we can all take each other's hands and just gather in. I'm going to get a little head start here. Remember that it doesn't take a million people to change the world, as Margaret Mead said so many times. It just takes a group of committed people. We can do this. Good morning, everybody. Let's bring the real high energy here. Like as, uh, for those of you watching, well, there should be well aware of that. Uh, I've been in a wheelchair for the last two years, so it's a little hard for me to get around sometimes. Um, I can walk, but not that well, and I wear out easily. So please bear with me, and uh, I'll do the best to get you the best images out there. I'm actually going backwards in a chair. So it's hard to see where I'm going. I don't have a rear view mirror. Yeah, we're like, we're like clients. We're here in downtown San Francisco at PG&E headquarters, 245 Market Street. Uh, we're on our way to the Consulate General of Japan at 50 Fremont, back there, where we started out. Uh, the, about 50 to 75 people with the protest. Uh, they're getting ready to march back. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to chat with me, uh, log on to the social stream and I'll be happy to respond. I'm going to stop the stream for just a second. I'm having a little problem. Huh. No, my camera doesn't want to shut off. Well. Oh, there we go. Oh, it's still working. Very nice to see you. still act, right? Good day, first. Closures, it was uh, Occupy San Francisco. Occupy San Francisco, so another stream live here. All right, we're back on the move again. I'm trying to stay ahead of the march a little bit.
have a little bit of a police escort today. We got a couple of cop cars that are following us. About five uh, police officers. So I guess they're not expecting trouble. And remember, this is a non-violent direct action. So there will hopefully be no violence here today. I'm pretty sure of that, actually. Your live streamer here is committed to a lifetime of non-violence. And if you're watching and you want to read and want to watch the video at a later time, you can go to my YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash Freeman Sullivan. Back on the move again. Oh, good job, man. I used to be a down here. Yeah? I come down here a lot. More than I really want to, but... Because I don't have to work down here anymore. Yeah, I used to work down in these stupid buildings. As a systems analyst and a uh, systems administrator. Look at that, the 